Yes, uh, the trickster, the missionary entry in the dictionary, uh, trickster as I mean Satan as Gawa, has had some problems as far as the uh, missionary endeavor to convert the Bushmen at, at Dekar is concerned because the Bushmen are very much confused about two key figures in the new religion that they're, they're learning about. One, Jesus Christ, whom they call Yesu Christe, and the other, Satan, <laughs> the devil. Uh, because having been told that Gawa is, Gawa is um, Satan, this creates problems, because to them, Gawa is not Satan. They, in fact, some, some Bushmen have told me, and I read it also in other sources, uh, um, I've done some research on where other mission attempts among Bushmen have been made, where they will say that Jesus, uh, 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 the trickster, whoever his name is, our Jesus, like Hysip, the, the, the courier will say, Hysip is our Jesus. You know, so they identify, because they see in Jesus, Jesus the miracle maker, you know, who changes, uh, uh, who who, uh, the re who re resurrects himself, who heals people, uh, who makes a lot of bread and fish out of nothing. They see all this as, as something that trickster does, especially the resurrection bit, because a trickster oftentimes there are many myths where the trickster dies, and then become becomes alive again, and so they they. Conflate in a number of other ways that are more specific. Uh, they conflate the trickster with Jesus. And now here they are told by the missionary, the trickster is Satan. And this has led to the logical, on their part, conclusion on their part, which horrifies the missionary because it's grand heresy, that... Satan is Jesus. I mean, imagine that, right? I mean, that's un unthinkable. It, 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 I, I can't even say it without... It, it's an abomination. <laughs> and I presented this paper in Heidelberg, which is the, the bastion of, uh, of uh, um, what, the oldest uh, theology, <laughs> rational uh, Lutheran theology school in, in Germany. <laughs> and uh, that was interesting. I, I, Presented that paper at a conference there, um, and um, but it's it's just one of a number of ways in which the mission enterprise about which I've done that's another aspect of my research. I have a chapter about it in in Trixis and Trancers, where I look at all these various mission stations among Bushmen that started back in the 18, 18th century already, seventeen hundreds, and they all failed. And I review all these various mission attempts in my book. And then I look at contemporary ones, including the one at Dekar. And none of these mission attempts of missionized Bushmen worked. Uh, for one thing, the theology is th this dualistic uh, theology of good, evil, uh, God, devil, um, is, is very confusing to to a mythology and cosmology and belief system in which good and evil are not dichotomized. They converge in the same, in the same key divinity, uh, who is also the protagonist of stories, who is a vulgarian and lecher at the same time that he is a heilbringer and a, and a, and a god. <laughs> and uh, anthropologists ever since Pater Schmidt have struggled with this, how to reconcile this. And the, the most common way is to s simply attribute it to that that uh, it's acculturation, that uh, confusion, that the Bushmen got different ideas from different people and mixed them up, uh, that they're not integral to 
the belief system, but they are uh, shreds and patches, amalgamation of different things from outside influence, uh, different outside uh, in influences from the Bantu people, the missionaries, the, that the Bushmen never fully integrated, and thus they have this this strange trickster god that uh, conflates within his being good and evil, you know, which Christianity keeps apart. But there are other things, like the Bushmen are not, I think Christ, the Christian church, the, the mission station, the mission farm, this is all a, it's an institution that requires sedentism, you know, that it's something that Christianity is a religion for sedentary people. It's not a religion for for hunter gatherers, you know. It, it's post Neolithic, <laughs> and a lot of these earlier mission stations that were set up amongst hunting gathering bushmen, rather than this one at Dekar, where you already had quasi settled people. There were sedentary bushmen on the farms, but not fully sedentary. They still moved around a lot. That sedentism and Christianity are wedded, and nomadism and Bushmen are wedded, so the two, the, don't, it's incompatible, right? Uh, so, um, I mean, there are a number of other reasons these mission stations failed that had to do with historical pressures, like the settlers who were out to either forcefully uh, enslave b Bushmen, you know, to force them to be farm laborers, uh, force them into farm service, or the downright genocidal assaults against them, they didn't really want missionaries there to, because it was too too difficult on their conscience to have Bushmen sub, uh, at mission stations receiving uh, receiving uh, you know the, the the true faith, and at the same time uh, uh, treating them with such barbarity, you know, as uh, when they. Uh, as they did uh, in their commandos and in their forced labor uh, initiatives. Um, right. Uh, the uh, I'm not sure where we are now. Oh yeah. Then there's some more stuff on I uh, stuff on on religion here. That oh these are oh yeah the one there there are a couple of pieces from totemism to shamanism and uh, Bushman religion, Khoisan religion. I, I did a number of, later on in my, uh, at the later part of my academic career, I wrote some uh, encyclopedia articles. Uh, I think uh, this is part of a scholar's um, progression. You, you do your PhD and then you publish freshly uh, minted, uh, uh, ethnographically backed papers that are based on your PhD research. Then you go into your own projects, you get your own grants and your own project, a book or two, and then you begin to run out of steam and you write <laughs> encyclopedia articles, and I did about a dozen of those. And then uh, you, you retire, and then you regain your steam because retirement is one uninterrupted sabbatical, and you start you start afresh with things that are no longer in the mainstream because you don't need to worry about publish and perish. You can do whatever you want, and that's where I'm at now, and I'm enjoying it. Anyway, um, that's a, a, a tangent. Oh yeah, so there's some encyclopedia articles here, which I wrote on what had become crystallized into my main interest, Bushman religion, myth, art, ritual, um, folklore. And one of these, I really enjoyed doing that in, in Richard Lee's and Richard Daly's uh, Cambridge Encyclopedia of Hunter, Hunters and Gatherers. He asked me to do the piece on hunter-gatherer religion, which was very um, a challenge because is there such a thing as hunter-gatherer religion? <laughs> is there such an animal? Is there such a category? It starts with the question, is there such a category as hunter-gatherer? Uh, it becomes compounded when you look at the, the religion of such, such, a, such a construct. Anyway, but I struggled with it, and I think 
whatever, uh, totemism, shamanism, the trickster. Uh, there are certain key elements in, in, uh, that are not necessarily exclusive to, to hunter-gatherer religion, but that somehow fit into, into that, that fit, that um, are congruent with hunter-gatherers as people who live within and off nature, who are close to, to, to nature, who have a certain form of sociality based on sharing and um, egalitarianism. I think there is a religion, a certain religious uh, configuration that, that is, goes with that. And that's a theme also, by the way, in Trixis and Trancers. The subtitle of this book is Bushman, Religion and Society, in which I try to explain the, um, the uh, hair-raisingly complicated feature of, uh, of Bushman religion, that it's absolutely incoherent. It is just beset with incoherence. There's nothing, in, in everyone tells you something different. There's not a, a common core, unless you, you really uh, talk in generalities. So it was very, very difficult. Uh, so this book is about Bushman religion, which is ambiguous, incoherent, um, disjointed, and I try to explain that by looking at Bushman society and find that Bushman society too is very fluid, is flexible, is is almost in some ways um, um, it, it's labile, structurally labile. Uh, there's lots of um, uh, well, anyway, I, I work that out. I work out the. I have the first two chapters about Bushman society, social organization and ethos, in which stuck flexibility and tolerance and openness and lack of strict dual rules, uh, um, great uh, structural um, and ideological flexibility. All this is there. And then I try to explain the same feature in, in their belief system with respect to, to that that looseness of structure, the ability of structure in society. I don't know whether it works, uh, but um, it's an attempt anyway. Uh, uh, an attempt to make sense of what is a very complicated uh, religion. Um, um, complicated because it's so incoherent um, to me, to the outsider. Maybe it's not. Co maybe it's coherent <laughs> to a Bushman, right? Well, the revisionism de debate is something else that maybe I, I, I spent uh, quite a bit of time in my career on that, much of it in uh, collaboration with, with Richard Lee, who uh, is, uh, was at the center of this debate, which was launched in the mid, late 80s by Edwin Wilmson, um, and before that by Thomas Hedlund uh, amongst Malaysians. Southeast Asian hunter-gatherers, the uh, issue being, are Bushmen aboriginals or are they social marginals uh, that are attached in a ensurfment, sur servile relationship to, to uh, uh, regional uh, agro-pastoral state societies uh, who, uh, to whom they pro to which they are connected, you know, as as servants, as cattle herds, uh, the the sort of scenario we've seen amongst the the pygmies, the Mbuti, you know, where they are attached to more or less closely to Bantu-speaking uh, agri agriculturalists as as servants, sometimes as spies, um, as uh, and the uh, Wilson started this debate by arguing that. For centuries, if not millennia, the Bushmen were never really um, autonomous, Aboriginal hunter-gatherers pursuing a, a um, archaic, pre-agricultural mode of existence, but that they had always been more or less closely associated with and attached to politically, economically, to um, regional agripastoral states. So th that. 
that was uh, Land Filled with Flies was the book um, uh, um, Wilson wrote about this, in which he targeted especially Richard Lee as the so-called isolationist who um, put forward uh, a uh, figment uh, of the uh, aboriginal uh, isolated pristine hunter-gatherer whose way of life uh, is ancient, uh, has prehistoric um, contours, you know, and stuff like that. Well, this was the debate, the great debate, some people refer to it as, the Kalahari debate. But it wasn't just restricted to the Kalahari because it moved also to other parts of the world where hunter-gatherers were, including the Arctic, I understand. I, I remember reading, I forget who wrote the paper, um, about where the this revisionism issue uh, was um, brought into what to Inuit studies, uh, and um, the also prehistorians have dealt with it, archaeologists by looking at prehistoric hunter gatherers. So it was a very uh, uh, heated debate. It was polarized into two camps, and um, Richard, as I said, was the main target, uh, and he. He, he he asked me to, like a, a lot of the literature that, the ethno-historical literature on, on that this debate uh, was at the core of the debate uh, were German sources, German colonial writers, you know, uh, colonial officers and farmers who wrote reports on Bushmen. And uh, uh, so my role in these various papers we did together in the, the current anthropology Apology carried that debate over several issues, and history in Africa had a, a, lo a long paper on it to which Wilmson responded about eight years later. Now the debate is pretty well over, I think. Uh, anyway, the Richard, I provided the because I have the German. Uh, I I read the German sources, and the two of us. Uh, using that material plus ethno ethno-historical material plus uh, ethnographic data that Richard and others have collected, well, we held up the our end of the <laughs> campaign. I think what has happened now is, my view anyway, and I wrote the one piece I did myself on, and as my own author, where I put my own position forward, is that piece in, wherever it's listed somewhere, in, in the and again, an encyclopedia article. Um, I um, the way I see it is that both are right and both are wrong. There are some regions in the Kalahari that, not maybe until recently, but certainly in in the nineteenth century, certainly the eighteenth century, that were completely isolated. And I found some of these in the ethnohistorical literature, for example. In, in, in Namibia, in southern Namibia, and uh, some regions there, central Kalahari, where people, and uh, also the um, some of the Junkasi territory, uh, that was at the core of the debate, geographically, where people, demonstrably, on the basis of ethno-historical literature, the Bushmen <coughs> lived isolated, in isolation. You know, hundreds of kilometers away from others and with hardly any, if any, contact, were able to, and this is backed by archaeological um, excavations in certain regions, were able to, by John Yellen, to pursue, retain uh, the archaic foraging lifeways. You know. In other regions, other regions of Southern Africa had had extensive historical contact with, with herding people, agripastoral people, over centuries, if not millennia, maybe, maybe, maybe for as much as two thousand years. So, in that in that scenario, the the revisionism position holds, you know, Wilson. 
position where the Bushmen indeed were. They, they uh, incorporated often through force, often um, in, in terms of ensurfment, into the agro-pastoral Bantu state society. So both scenarios apply, uh, and I never really quite understood what the big... The, well, the, the, the main reason was the claim on the part of Wilson and company that all Bushmen everywhere were marginal, social marginals, rather than, um, you know, uh, an, a, uh, an archaic Aboriginal sort of form, uh, so societal form. Um, it was the extreme, the the the, um, the uh, um, dogm dogmatism uh, of the other position that I think was was the main the main issue because uh, I think even Richard uh, certainly in his in his writing never never uh, neglected the historical the factor of contact you know and of agro-pastoral, Ubuntu-speaking pastoralists and their influence on the Bushmen. I think it was a bit of a <coughs> straw man debate on the part of, of the revisionists. Anyway, little sense talking about it because it's pretty well over. Um, uh, I think uh, the fact that um, both the revisionism scenario and the so-called isolation scenario has merit and is applicable to different regions at different times in Southern Africa, um, it's pretty well accepted now, yeah. Um, and this, the forages in transition, uh, well, I've done, I did a book uh, together with an archaeologist and a Historian uh, Andrew Smith and Candy Malharb and myself it's the historian and myself the ethnographer and then Penny Ernst is just basically the editor of it. Uh, we did this book. This is an interesting book, um, The Bushman of Southern Africa. It's basically uh, for high school readers, for for laymen, educated laymen, um, and it's about the prehistory, history, and contemporary situation of the Bushmen of Southern Africa, Botswana and South Africa and Namibia. What, what I like, what's interesting about the project is it's a post-apartheid project that was, that was done by a number of South African academics as a kind of public education project to uh, deconstruct the notions that were held and, and, and nurtured by the apartheid government about the, the ethnic identity and autonomy and, uh, of, of each of these, these groups. You know, this essentialism this, the, uh, the, um, uh, that uh, of, um, of the, the earlier, the apartheid view that, that um, artificially, uh, for its own sinister, uh, cynical uh, political reasons, um, you know, uh, kind of birdcaged these groups, either through territorial policies like the Bantustan, or educational policies where they would uh, teach students in their own uh, ethnic schools and, and so on. The, the idea was to deconstruct these ethnic stereotypes that the South African government had uh, sustained for so long by b writing a bunch of a number of books that show one or another ethnic group. This is on the Bushmen. There was one on the Khoi Khoi people uh, to uh, to enlighten people and 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 in the new South Africa and make give a more realistic portrayal of these ethnic groups as not relics of the past, artificially. Uh, identified with all sorts of arbitrary markers, but as real people that are part of the multi-state society of, of the new South Africa and all that, you know. So there's an ideological, um, an ideological um, uh, 
motivation behind this series of books that, that I myself endorse, so I could partic participate in the project. Yeah. Yeah.